This is the Dental Up Podcast, your daily source for insights from dentists and leaders in the industry. Brought to you by Keating Dental Lab, a full-service, award-winning dental lab that is here to add value to your dental practice. With high-quality restorations, friendly, reliable service, the best products, and prices, come experience the Keating difference. Visit KeatingDentalLab.com for details. Hi, I'm Bob Brandon, General Manager here at Keating Dental Lab. Thanks for joining us today on the Dental Lab Podcast. My guest today is Dr. Eric Markowitz, a prosthodontist and accredited fellow of the AACD. Today, Dr. Markowitz is going to share with us his strategy on dealing with the most difficult task in restorative dentistry, the single central. A wise dentist once said, the single central is for reputation, not for profit. Patience and communication are paramount in achieving the perfect result, and Dr. Markowitz will take us through how he explains the process to his patient and how he communicates his thoughts with the lab tech, including high-level interoral photography. Please join me in welcoming to the Dental Up podcast, Dr. Eric Markowitz. Dr. Markowitz, thank you for your time, and thanks for coming on the Dental Up podcast this afternoon. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Well, Dr. Markowitz, you've been an extremely valued uh, customer of Keating for well over 10 years now, and I'm fortunate enough to, to speak with you on a, on a regular, on a weekly basis about a number of cases, and you've taught me so much, particularly about cosmetic cases, cosmetic dentistry. You're a member of the AACD and went through a formal prosthodontic residency training. Can you tell the, the dental up uh, world a little bit about your, your background before we get into some nuts and bolts here? So, yeah, so I'm a local Washingtonian, went to Maryland Dental School and did my, my prosthetics training at Maryland. And then after that, back in the, in the mid-90s, they had a implant fellowship. So we did that. And then I joined my dad in his private practice in Washington, D.C. He had been there um, since about 1969 or so. So I joined him in his practice. And fast forward, here we are. Awesome. And has it always has has your father in your practice always had a, a cosmetic a cosmetic feel a cosmetic focus to it? Yeah, I mean, back when cosmetic dentistry was really in its early days, my dad was very involved with some cutting edge stuff. And had a lab in his office since uh, 1970. They were very innovative with their cosmetic solutions, and he was one of the founding members of the AECD when it first uh, when it first started coming to life back about. 35 years ago, I guess. Yeah. I, I remember I remember walking the the entrance to the Gaylord Hotel with you for the AACD meeting when it was at the Inner Harbor a number of years ago. And yeah. and we walked by your we walked by your dad's photo. And what what number of president was he? I think he was around uh, number 10, give or take. Yeah. Wow. Give or take. <laughs> that that, that is would, early. That yeah. would have been about 19 uh I guess about 1994 or so, I think was when he was president. Yeah. That's fantastic. Lifetime, lifetime ago. Yeah. And you're still a member of the AACD? I am. I am, as is my associate, Dr. Magori. Excellent. She will be going to the meeting um, uh, this, this April. Yeah, oh, April? April, okay. uh, April or May. Yeah, I think it's she's, she's going this year, so... Okay. I'll be home. Uh, I'll be home running the running the ship. Uh, <laughs> she's learning. Somebody's got to stay home and make money, huh? Somebody's got to stay home and make sure that stuff continues. Yeah, absolutely. Even, even in Washington D.C., I want to make sure something goes right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's 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 not a whole lot uh, going right, and not so much no, in, in my home state as well. We're um, kind of a train wreck out here on the left coast, also. It's interesting. Yeah, yeah. Interesting times. Hopefully, hopefully better times ahead. Yeah, let's hope. I mean, you know, we we elect these leaders to lead, not to not to react and and yeah. make things worse. But yeah, well, unfortunately, there's a lot of getting your job and then keeping your job is priority one for a lot of these folks, and that creates a little bit of a conflict. Shall we no, say? Conflict. I I agree. You know, term yeah. term limits are a great idea. You know, look term at uh, a great idea. Look at what happened over in Russia when uh, somebody decided to do away with term limits and rewrote the constitution. And <laughs> that's an so unfortunate yeah. situation over there. Yeah. 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 I completely agree. Completely well, agree. we can do a, we can do a political show some other time. I think, um, 
let's, uh, <laughs> let's let's talk let's talk a little bit more about dentistry and and something that something that you and I actually spoke about earlier this morning and earlier this week and then I just got back from a from a dentist office is in my opinion the hardest thing to do in dentistry is is match the single central and and we're going it we're going through it right now with with one of your cases can you tell us a little bit about about your case you know no no names obviously or or any just just tell us tell us how the patient presented and and your your solution to the problem so yeah this young lady came to my office i say about a month ago with a complaint that she didn't like her her front single anterior crown on number eight which uh, took the dental office about four or five tries and a trip to the laboratory. And it was cemented permanently the day before she came to my office. And she said, get this thing out of my mouth and get me something that looks better. Everybody likes to try to do cosmetic dentistry. Um, They don't always pay attention to the principles of stump shade, of uh, blocking out uh, the stump shade, poor material selection. I mean, this was, this was all the above. This was, this was blocking out a very, very dark stump with a, uh, with a material which didn't have the capabilities to block out a dark stump. So it just really looked dark and lifeless. And yeah. hence, hence and the, even, the reason why she showed up. Do you, do you know what the first type of crown was? The material? It, when I when I removed it, it felt like Emacs, which is something I like very much. But if you've got a very very dark stump on, underneath, sometimes it just it just doesn't quite cut it for blocking that out. Um, even though you and I have done that many times, where we've used layers of uh, layers of, of op- opaque materials mm-hmm. to get a better baseline block out, and then we've layered on top of that, then they just didn't do that. They just did a, a straight Emacs, and they layered it, and it it didn't it didn't. Um, it didn't have nearly the correct value, and uh, the, the color was actually too white. The color of the material was too white, but the color of the tooth when she smiled was just too gray, very mm. dark. Yeah, very dark. Yeah, and it's it's a common problem. I mean, the single central with the dark substrate. You know, I think a lot of these patients, um, you know, have trauma as a young kid, and usually right. from a fall. And, you know, the tooth just, you know, becomes darker over time and then they get to be middle aged and and, you know, want to do something about it. Obviously, was this a, is this tooth vital? Root canal treated. Yeah. Root canal treated, old metal post, um, dark brown stump. So in these cases, I was explaining to her, we can either switch to a zirconia base with ceramic layering, which is what we did in this case, or we could take the two, take the prep down further and layer that intraorally with a, a block out material. But I was a little worried about that for strength reasons. So we decided to block out with zirconia and, and, and that's, it's working out well. We're just, as you know, we're doing a one final shade correction and we should be, should be ready to place it. Yeah, these things, these things rarely happen, you know, on the first on the first attempt, especially, you know, because you have you have the AACD training in the eye and and it's, and it's got to be perfect. She came to you for perfection and right. and, you know, we're going to deliver it. And and we know and then the technicians know, too, that, you know, they rarely get the single central. You know, sometimes they'll they'll get it on the first attempt, but it's usually on somebody that's not extremely discerning or picking uh, very yeah. picky. But now we do, and we do, we do tell them, look, you're, you're coming in with a, a big problem. You're going to do just, just do the one single tooth. Perfection might not be really realistic. You know, we have to set expectations reasonably. And I say, we can get it, you know, a hell of a lot better from where it is. And, but if you want perfection, it might take a slew of tries and, or you might want to invest in doing the other central incisor as well, which she did not want to do for a variety of reasons. I don't blame her. But then I told her then the, the flip side of that, of that is you might have to accept slight variation. Yeah. And, and more than one visit or more than two oh, visits. Sure. Here. Yeah. No, no. I told her from the, from the jump, it was going to be a couple of trines, most likely to try yeah. as close as we could. And most people, when they're doing a front tooth, they're pretty understanding about that. Less so about a molar, but but when yeah. it comes to a front tooth, a couple of more visits isn't a problem. Right. So so you've already explained your rationale for material selection, and and you and I spoke about that in 100% agreement there. Talk about the the color communication and the photography. How 
how you went about communicating the the stump, the substrate color to us and and the final color really desired. So this one was interesting, obviously, obviously sending photos, either emailed or printed uh, photos helps um, to kind of get you in the ballpark to start with. Of course, she wasn't any shade um, between shades. She's in the A range, but she's what we call an A0.5. And um, she's significantly lighter than A1, but nowhere near a bleach shade. So it's just a, a lot of trial and error goes into that. So we draw pictures, we, we label it, we do our photographs, we do a, a tremendous amount of description about, in this case, the level of translucency and the intensity of the translucency and the location of the translucency, along with incisal edge halo position, thickness, whether it's a subtle halo or a stark white halo. And then we get it in and try it in, you know, and then we can start make correct make corrections from there. Yeah, it's fantastic. Tell, tell us about um, your your camera. Your, I know you have multiple cameras and, you know, how you take your photos. You know, you don't have to get into settings or anything, but, you know, the, the background that you use and everything like that. Yeah, you know, for, for this particular case, you know, I, was, I just took close ups of her of her smile. So there was really no background involved. It was just only I mean, I don't even know if the lips are fully in there or not because it was up, such an up close picture. Um, you know, we use the cameras that we, the Canon, the Canon camera from, from Lester Dine with the, the dental lens, at the, uh, the Tamron lens. It's still tricky, you know, even with, even with getting a really good camera and getting really good photos, the color correctedness of these pictures, anyone that's tried to do gingival colored porcelain off of a photograph knows that it's not correct most of the time, but it, what it can tell you is it's really good to show you when you do your try-ins differentiation with what you're trying to match. So it might not be exactly the exact color, but you can see how much lighter it is than the neighbor. It's really good for showing the pattern of translucency, the uh, quantity of translucency, a little more about how, how subtle the translucency is, whether there's lobes or lobules showing underneath or whether it's straight across, things like that. You know, picture's worth a thousand words. Oh, absolutely. Sure. And and the photos that you sent today, you know, I could definitely see and, you know, I, I blew it up and I, I now see the amber highlights, you know, through the through the halo and everything at the yeah. size of the ledge. So and you could even, you know, uh, for anyone out there watching, uh, you, you can even try it with just take your take a photo with your iPhone and, yeah. and send it even something like that, usually with the flash off can be pretty well. It can, it can do pretty well for communication. Yeah. Let's, let's talk about that just a little bit, like the, the lighting, you know, the flash, the sequence, you know, we, we get so many photos of, you know, we get a shade tab and the doctor's already, he's, he's finished prepped <laughs> and, and we get the, you know, the shade tab, you know, in the image after the patients had their mouth open for 20 minutes with, you know, yeah. the saliva ejector and the bright lights and everything like that. Tell yeah. us a little bit a little bit about your sequencing and and how you orient the shade tab for your for your photography. Well, so either you take the either you take the photo before you start your prep when everything is well hydrated. I'll generally flip the tab upside down and just do edge to edge with that. Perfect. Yeah. Um, and I'll usually go I'll usually go back to a point where where I'm getting the front four four to six teeth. I find when I do two up close, sometimes the, the color really does wash out. So I don't always do a you know gigantic picture of one tooth. I like to get a little bit of, of the background color. The other way to do is if you forget to do that after you prep the teeth, just tell the patient close down and uh, put them back, let them relax and close their eyes for about 10, 15 minutes, and come back and get your photo then. Otherwise, you will have a you will have a distorted color. Um, you'll have some chalkiness, so that's not great for color color matching when the patients teeth are desiccated right yeah and we and we see that all the time and we make a restoration to to match a dehydrated desiccated tooth and it comes yeah. out too bright but the other, uh, the other thing we'll do obviously if someone's doing a whitening even even an at-home whitening if they if i give them the material used at home i'll say here it is started started no later than three weeks before we prep your tooth and finish at least two weeks before we prep the tooth. 
because you always have some some color fallback. It always pulls yep. back a little bit. You know, they yep. leave their they go from an A three to an A one, and when they come back, they're often an A one and a half or an A two to prep the tooth. So you don't want to do it too quickly after whitening. That's for sure. Exactly. Yeah, that's that's actually the first question we ask when patients come visit to lab the lab for you know custom shade matching shade taking is uh, when was the last time you bleached <laughs> and if it's oh I did it last night or two days ago well you got to come back sorry yeah, a lot of times they will because they're trying to get every ounce of, of lightning they can mm -hmm. but they don't realize that by the time the crown comes back from the lab and you're and you're another week or two out the, the color's not going to match at all yeah absolutely that's, that's no fun. No. So, so tell us where we're, where we're at now and, and how we're going to, how we're going to fine tune, how we're going to really finesse your patient's uh, color, because we've done, we, we did the try in and, and I saw, I saw the result and I saw where we're deficient. If, if we didn't have photography, how, how would you describe, how would you describe the problem to me? So without photography, and I think we talked about this a little today when we were discussing it on the phone, I, I, I talk in terms of intensity of the translucency, you know, I call you mild, moderate, or severe. And, you know, severe translucency is so see-through at the edge that it almost can look can look very gray. This patient has a lot of translucency, but it is more subtle. So we talked about decreasing the intensity level of the translucency, so it's not so so see-through at the edge to match the other teeth. So we will use we'll use words like that. We'll talk about about how much we have to raise or lower the value. You and I were talking chrome in a day to try to get it, you know, in, as I said, she wasn't a, a shade tab match, but she's an A range person. I mean, her teeth are in the A range, just in the A range lower than the A range starts. Um, she's not in the B range where it's, you know, too yellow. And she's certainly not in the, in the C or D range where it gets, you know, too gray. So she's in the a, and she's not in the bleach range, even though she's bleached. She's in the A range. So we talk about things like that. You and I discuss things about what range we're working in. Yep. So when you're talking to the technician, they have an idea of where we're trying to get to. Because when you just say something like A0, I mean, there is no A0. So the one tech will make an A0 that's chalk white. Another person makes an A0 that's a little bit lighter than an A1. So you really have to be very descriptive about how much lighter than a one you're talking or how much darker than a bleach shade, uh, you know, no, and that's, that's perfect because yeah. I mean, we get so many prescriptions that just say a two or B one, let's just pick a shade. Let's just go a two. I mean, as a technician, I can make an a two crown a hundred different ways. And we have, you know, we're, we're a pretty large laboratory. We have 25 ceramists that can really make a, make an A2 25 different ways. So it's really, it's, it's dialing it in. It's, it's focusing on, you know, the, the intensity, the translucency, all, all that, all these words, all these descriptive words that you're mentioning can give us, can really paint a better picture really of what we're supposed to do. I mean, and is there, is there a, uh, is there an incisal edge halo? Um, if so, is it kind of white or is it a little more the natural shade of the tooth? Is it is it just a very, very thin layer at the edge? Is it a, is it a millimeter wide? I mean, it, it, there's differences all there. Do they have little craze lines in their teeth? If so, are they thin? Are they ultra thin? Are they a little thicker? Are they white? Are they, are they brown? So, you know, all these things are very helpful. Yeah, the, the terminology... You know, we, we love to see that on prescriptions and we love to talk about that because then that that brings out the artistic side in, in us. And and dentists and dental technicians by nature are artistic people. And, you know, the more the more information we have, the better we can can make it for your patient. That's definitely the goal. I mean, the goal is the goal is is to get it as close as you can, as fast as you can. And, and when you just say to someone, make me an A2 crown. And don't even put what material you want. Is it is it is it uh, is it a, a translucent uh, aesthetic zirconia? Is it the high strength, you know, less translucent zirconia? Is it is it feldspathic or Emax or Emax layered with feldspathic or Empress? I mean, there's a million different ways to do this stuff, and you got to really think about about the final color. Are you going to use Are you going to use translucent cement? Are you going to use more opaque cement? Are you going to use dark cement? All these things affect the final the final appearance. Yeah, absolutely. And had this been an Emax restoration, I mean, you would have you would have had to opacify, you know, the the substrate 
right. in, in some regard to to yeah. really get this to match. Yeah, it wouldn't even even with Emacs, which which I enjoy using um, for these restorations, it just it was just going to look dead. There were, it was too dark to really block it out predictably. Yep. So I felt the, I felt the zirconia was a better a better option for that. Absolutely. So let, let's switch gears a little bit. Let's let's talk um, about some of the, the toys you have in your office. You know, I'm a big fan of, of the scanners and mm. and we enjoy working on your, your cases that we get from a digital scan as well. Tell us how long you, you've had it and, and what it is and, and why you went with that with that brand. Well, we're, we have a, um, an Omnicam uh, with the Serac milling unit, which we use when appropriate. Of course, dentists are notorious for loving gizmos and investing tons of money in them. And then once you do that, you either use it for nothing or you use it for everything. And when you're, when you're doing stuff in office, it's, it's, it's just not for everything. There's a lot of cases. I, for me, it's probably 19 out of 20. I still send to the laboratory. I like having, I like having the milling unit in my office for certain situations, especially, you know, patients who, who, who are, you know, living out of country or are or, or in for a very, very short period of time. But I will say, even with you guys, for I had a patient in from Serbia and he needed a, a bridge done and you we, we prepped it and scanned it on a Monday and you had it back to me on Thursday from across the country because 20 minutes after I sent it to you, it was already in production. Yep, so, I remember that. And yeah. I'll tell you, those, the, the scanned the scanned and then and then uh, printed models that um, that we did. it's it just it's miraculous how well that stuff fits it's really quite quite incredible but as anyone who's been doing that knows you get a lot of bleeding you get too far subgingival it's just it's just not the not the method of choice for that you still have to go analog for a lot of those and for people who are in my practice a lot of you know more mature people dealing with gigantic old silver fillings and cracked mm. back teeth where you have deep margins, scanning doesn't always do the trick. Matter of fact, in those cases, scanning for me and my hands more times than not is not as good of an option for, for those. So we'll take traditional impressions most of the time and uh, still works like a charm. Yeah, th- those are wise words. And that might even be the title of this uh, podcast, because nothing in life is 100%. And you have to know, you have to really understand the limitations of the technology. And if if not, you, you can't really push the envelope, you have to go back to what you know is going to work, you got to do what works. And I will say, uh, yeah, you, you can't, you can't push the parameters of what the materials and uh, technology were developed for. Like I said, people love, you know, for dentists, the dentist spends uh, 150 grand getting a scanner and a milling unit uh, in an oven. They're going to damn well use it most of the time. Now, for me, I always, I always equate it to a, a, a restaurant buying new tables and chairs. It doesn't really help your bottom line, but sometimes you just got to do it if you're going to be a high end restaurant. And if you're going to be, the higher end downtown DC or New York or, or LA office, you, you got to have the stuff you need. And you do though have to discern whether it's appropriate to use for certain cases. And um, they're just, they're just over in my mind uh, in my practice, what I see from patients and the stuff I have to redo for people in office milling units are drastically overused. They're just not for everything, and people like to do them for everything. Yeah, and I, I think you're very, you're very accurate in your statement. You know, they they buy a system for one hundred fifty thousand dollars, and they they see the, the monthly, you know, lease payment they have to make on it, and they're like, "Gosh, we got to make this work for everything," and it's just not the case. Right. So, so for me, if you're in my mind, if you're if you're you know running a dental practice like mine or like a lot of your clients have there's a there's there, there's a cost of doing business and sometimes that is spending on certain technology that really doesn't necessarily increase your productivity and and that's okay you know if you if you have a functional ripped up ugly old dental chair and you replace it with a new pristine beautiful leather one that doesn't really increase your productivity but sometimes you just have to do that that is the cost of doing business right there the absolutely business. Yep. Right. Yep. Yep. You have a very, I wouldn't say, well, I, I would say unique um, way of restoring implants. Um, 
tell us, uh, you know, which implant system you've gone with and, and how and how you restore your single unit implants and, and sort of your, your logic behind that. Because I love it, by the way. Huge fan. That's so, so we've been through lots of iterations in the last 30 years, like everybody else has, right? When I was coming out of dental school and my prosthetics training, everything was going towards cemented cases, no matter what. So for the first you know, 15, 20 years, we cemented everything, even when the implant's coming right out through the dead center of the occlusal table, you're still cementing it. Um, now, of course, 20 years later, when you either have to go in and replace a crown that's chipped or um, have a screw loosening or a problem with that, and then you gotta, you know, pray to the screw gods that you're gonna <laughs> stick your drill into the spot where the screw is. I mean, yeah. I, I always make, I always make in my charts, diagrams as to where the screw access holes are under all that cemented cases, because I draw all kinds of pictures to just to try to give me a better shot at that happening where sometimes we'll design it with a little, a little certain speck of um, stain in a certain place over where the screw hole will be. I do that sometimes. And then of course we all shift it towards um, back to screw retained, which, you know, makes sense. If there's a problem, it's, certainly easier to easier to get it out and to, to have to replace that and then we went towards well now if we're doing screw retained um what do you put underneath of it you know do you do a stock do you do you know stock abutment that you're building to and connect it in the lab do you do you uh fire porcelain right right to a an, another abutment that you made so I never like stock abutments. I think they, I think they create all kinds of problems. You have all kinds of contouring issues, all kinds of uh, of issues at the gum line with emergence profiles. And um, so, what we do is we'll still use the traditional custom abutment, which you guys make beautifully, and we we uh, we have you cut them back in the in the lab and make the crown over top and connect it in lab. And so it's a you know it's a it's a it's a cemented case which is created which is converted to a screw retained case and you and i have uh, finally gotten in sync about where to put the margins on those because you don't want to have your uh your buckle margin of metal too close to the gum line since you're doing a a, a crown over top and cementing it in the lab you could you can make it go as deep as you want and build your emergence out of the ceramic material and that way if you have any gingival recession over the next 10, 20 years, you still have at least less chance of metal showing. Um, so we do, we've done, we do them like that. Thank you for listening to the Dental Up podcast, your daily source for insights from dentists and leaders in the industry. This episode is sponsored by Keating Dental Lab, here to add value to your dental practice with high quality restorations, friendly, reliable service, the best products and prices, come experience the Keating difference. Visit KeatingDentalLab.com for details.